And if it's okay by you, I'll kind of give you a, your viewers a bit of a like a two minute history of the field, if you will, of how we came to this point. Because it's very interesting um, for me because I've kind of seen the journey uh, around 2013, 2014 is when deep learning for natural language processing started to really take over. Before that, it was more traditional statistical uh, methods based on n-grams and analysis of frequencies of n-grams, which were the dominant method. And before that, it was much more linguistic structure and syntactic methods and logical methods, right? So we started going from a more logic-based AI world towards statistical methods, but simpler ones over n-grams. And then around the 2013-2014 timeframe is when deep learning models for NLP started to take, take, take off right after the computer vision, deep learning for computer vision, which was with a couple of years before that. So in those early days, uh, well, not that early, but about a decade ago now, uh, recurrent neural networks and LSTM models and GRU models and bidirectional LSTMs, those kinds of models were the, the dominant models that helped with the number of these language tasks. And in particular, if you think about language models, what is a language model doing? It takes as input a sequence of text and it predicts the next word, right? So if you give it an input, like the most amazing soccer player in the world is, and then it might spit out Lionel Messi or uh, someone else, depending on which team you root for. Um, <laughs> Now, if you just apply the language model repeatedly, you can get a sequence of text out of that model, right? So that at some high level is how generative language models work. You give it a sequence of text, which could be a question, and, and then out comes another sequence of text, which is the answer. For people who have been playing around with chat GPT recently, this will be a familiar experience. Now with these models, the LSTM models and GRUs and bidirectional LSTMs and so on, they were doing better than the n-gram-based statistical models, but one problem they had was they couldn't remember very long sequences, right? So if you give it a long sequence of input text and then expect an output, it didn't do very well. So there were some problems with how the gradients worked and so on. Then came transformer models around 2017, 2018, uh, when that paper attention is all you need came out from Google and BERT models. And that at that time was a very interesting paper, but over the last few years, we have seen how big the impact of it has been. There have been tens of millions of downloads. Uh, if you look at Hugging Face, for example, and lots and lots of applications that were built off of BERT models as, as a common core or foundation model. And one of the nice things about those models is that you have the core model, but then you can adapt it to specific tasks. So you could have question answering or sentiment analysis or a bunch of other tasks that you build off of it. So that was a big step forward in, in this arc. Now, if you fast forward from that bird model moment, and there were a number of other variants in that neighborhood, there's distilled bird and Roberta and so on, the path to chat GPT had a few other innovations. One was uh, just the way tokenization works. So in the way language models work is you get a sequence of text, then each word gets broken down into some tokens. So if you say, stemming, then that might be broken down into stem and ing as the tokens. And then those get converted into something called embeddings, which are a way to encode, encode tokens in a more compact representation. And then those get processed by the model, right? So how you do the encoding can have a lot of impact on the, the, the compactness of the embedding and its density has impact on how, how much how big the token space is that you can efficiently 
represent and, and get trained on. And so there were some interesting innovations in that space with byte pair encodings. Um, and, then, and then there was uh, another big innovation around reinforcement learning based on human feedback, uh, which meant that when you're training these models, with the byte, core, byte pair encoding advancement and just the scale, we went all the way up to GPT-3. GPT-3 is like a 175 billion parameter model, which was trained on a very, very broad swath of text from the internet. And it, it could do amazing, amazing language generation. But a 175 billion parameter model is very, very expensive to train. Its inference is extremely expensive as well. It still found lots of useful applications, um, but the thought was one could do better. And then the one other innovation, key innovation that enabled that jump from GPT-3 to chat GPT was leveraging something called reinforcement learning with human feedback. And that meant that when you are training the models, in addition to the unsupervised training on large swaths of data to get the language model, you also did a small collection of inputs on which humans provided feedback where they were not only saying that this is the right answer to this question, but given a choice of options, they were kind of ranking them, saying this is better than that. And, and that helps with learning something called a reward function. And then that can then help the model do a better job of picking among options. Uh, and, and with that advancement, we came to chat GPT. Chat GPT is a uh, much smaller model, closer to the one to two billion mark in terms of number of parameters and closer in terms of number of parameters to BERT as well, which is in that same neighborhood. And yet it does a significantly better job uh, in language generation and question answering than GPT-3. So that's kind of the arc of the journey from logic-based methods to statistical and gram based methods into deep learning with LSTMs and GRU models and bidirectional LSTMs, then came transformer models, and then finally the current generation of GPT-like models. Uh, and the part of the reason I brought up this journey is that it's useful to have that framing in mind when you think about how should we go about validating or evaluating the models, which was your original question some time back. Now, there are, there are a few things that I would highlight as crucial when you're thinking about validating these kinds of models. First is human in the loop validation or evaluation is extremely crucial. And it's in some ways, that is at the very core of how ChatGPT works because the way it's trained to begin with, with reinforcement learning, with human feedback, sets it up in that direction. So this is something we will expect will be uh, like a, the number one pillar for validation of large language models, having a very crucial element of human in the loop of validation. Um, the second thing I would say is the large language model, as you know, is a foundation model. But then what you do is you fine tune that model to specific tasks, end tasks that you may want to actually solve. So that end task could be uh, could be a sentiment analysis model. Let's say you want to start with something like a GPT-3 model or a chat GPT model, and then you fine tune it to assess sentiments in, uh, in, in financial headlines to do stock picking or portfolio picking or something like that. Then the evaluation needs to be tied to the metrics associated with that end task. Right, And some of those metrics will be like the metrics we discussed before for accuracy of models and performance metrics and drift and robustness and so on. And some of them can be related to the business KPIs associated with the task. Right, So if you're using this model to generate uh, some stock picking advice, then you evaluate it based on how it's actually doing with its uh, in terms of making you money. 
or if you're using it to generate marketing content, which then you use to draw users, uh, potential users to your company's website, what are the marketing metrics? How are they getting impacted by its work? So that's the second pillar. So the first is just having a very significant element of human in the loop in the part of evaluation. Second is the focus on the end task and the metrics around it and, and go do a deep evaluation with respect to those metrics. The third thing I would say is, and this is where there's a lot of white space and an opportunity is a lot of the emphasis has historically been on the accuracy metrics, but some of the trustworthiness evaluations here, looking at deeper, deeper analysis that looks at the metrics, but also looks at the root causes for why metrics might be going up and down. And that's another area with the scale of these models and the sometimes the restricted APIs that you have to access them raise additional challenges that go beyond the traditional uh, deep learning model. So for example, um, if you're looking at a model that's 100 times bigger than what you're used to, gradient-based explanations uh, will have to will have to scale them as well. If you're looking at uh, restricted APIs like with OpenAI, for example, you don't get access to the model objects, so you can't compute gradients. So you'll have to do other forms of analysis to that might make use of the input-output behavior or the embeddings that 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 you will have access to through the API. So, so those are some areas where there's some there's some unique and distinctive uh, both challenges and opportunities for deeper validation of these models. And I would say that uh, your question is spot on. It's extremely important to do this validation right, uh, both before these kinds of models get started and st are starting to get used extensively in, in, lots of, uh, in lots of very high stakes use cases. And the impact of these models is going to be very significant in the world. And, that's something we can chat about as well.